Welcome to Caution Baptist Church online again for another Sunday. Uh, we're going to be listening to Eddie uh, speak today, but before we do, we're going to do some worship and if you would join us in prayer at your home. Lord Jesus, thank you for this opportunity to come together. No matter where we are, whatever we're doing, Lord God, you unify us, Lord. And Father, before we get into hearing your message, to which I pray that you would open up our eyes and our ears and be with Eddie as he speaks. Father, fill our hearts now with your words. These lyrics, Father God, these songs of worship, Lord, may we worship you no matter what we are doing, where we find ourselves in life, Lord God. May this be a time that we acknowledge you, Father God, as Lord and Saviour over our life. So, Lord God, may your kingdom come and your will be done in this worship today. Thank you. Amen. Psalm 95 says, O come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. Blessed be your name in the land that is plentiful. We stream Blessed be your name.
There is good news for the captive, good news for the shamed. There is good news for the one who walked away. There is good news for the doubter, the one religion fell. For the good Lord has come to seek and save. He's our rescuer. He's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. He is beauty for the blind man, riches for the poor. He's the friendship for the one the world ignores. He is pasture for the weary, a rest for those who strive. For the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. Yes, the good Lord is the way, the truth, the life. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer, we are free from sin forevermore. Oh how sweet the sound, oh how grace abounds, we will praise the Lord our rescuer. He's our rescuer, he's our rescuer. We are free from sin forevermore. Oh, how sweet the sound. Oh, how grace abounds. We will praise the Lord, our rescuer. Come and be chainless. Come and be fearless. Come to the foot of Calvary. For there is redemption for every affliction here at the foot of Calvary. So come and be chainless, come and be fearless, come to the foot of Calvary. Cause there is redemption for every affliction. Here at the foot of Calvary He's our rescuer He's our rescuer We are free from sin forevermore Oh how sweet the sound Oh how grace abounds We will praise the Lord our rescuer we will praise the Lord, our rescuer. How great the chasm that lay between us. How high the mountain I could not climb. In desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. The end is risen, Jesus Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of angels. Step down from glory to wear my sin and to bear my shame. 
cross has spoken, I am forgiven, the King of kings calls me his own, beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever, Jesus Christ, my living hope, hallelujah, praise the one who sent Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your buried body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Then came the morning that sealed the promise. Your very body began to breathe. Out of the silence, the roaring lion declared the grave has no claim on me. Jesus, yours is the victory. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Hallelujah. Praise the one who sent me free. Hallelujah. Death has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. You are my living hope. Hello brothers and sisters and welcome back to 1 Peter. Today we're going to be in chapter 4 and verses 7 through to 11. Last time we saw Peter urging us to arm ourselves with the attitude of the Lord Jesus Christ by resolving to do the will of God whatever that costs. Now today we're going to find Peter reminding us of just what it is to do the will of God. So we read 1 Peter chapter 4 and verse 7. The end of all things is near. Therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. 
To him be the glory and the power for ever and ever. Amen. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. What Peter's just described for us is the remarkable change that comes into the life of a person when they are converted to Jesus Christ. He's already reminded his readers of the way that they used to live. We saw that last time in verses 3 and 4, a lifestyle characterized by things like drunkenness, sexual immorality, orgies, and so on. It was a very destructive lifestyle, both for individuals and for societies. But now, by contrast, Peter says, verse 7, instead of drunkenness, clear-headedness. Verse 8, instead of lust, love. In, In verse 9, opening our homes for hospitality instead of for orgies. And in verses 10 and 11, using our gifts to serve other people rather than using other people for our own advantage and exploiting them in ways that are destructive. A very different way of living, and that's how to live the rest of your life for the will of God, says Peter, and it's what we're going to unpack now. But why live this way at all? Well, Peter answers that question up front at the beginning of verse 7. The end of all things is near. Now that sounds rather dramatic, doesn't it? But it is in fact the perspective of the whole of the New Testament. The very last words recorded in scripture from our Lord Jesus Christ are, behold, I am coming soon. You'll find that in the book of Revelation, chapter 22 and verse 20. Behold, I'm coming soon. Does that mean next week? Well, it might do, but not necessarily. That's not quite the point that Jesus or Peter are making. What they are saying very simply is this, that God has a plan, a purpose in history, and all the building blocks of God's plan have now been put in place, ready for the end. What is that purpose in history? Well, the Bible unfolds it for us. The whole point of history is that God should make a bride for his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And that bride is the church, made up of sinners who are forgiven and reconciled to God. Now, in order to put that plan into effect, God has had to take history through various stages, and we read of them in the rest of the Bible. But all those stages that are necessary have now been put in place. Things like the call of Abraham, the the history of the nation of Israel, the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, his life, his death, his resurrection, his ascension to heaven, and even the pouring out of the Holy Spirit so that we can preach that good news and gather in the body of Christ, his bride, gather in people from every nation, tribe, and tongue. And that means that all things are now ready. All that is needed is for Christ to return. And since we're living in the last act of this drama, as it were, that could happen any time. That's the point that Peter is making. When he says the end is near, it's less about a date. It's more about a practical application about how we should live. He's saying to us that history is not like being on a merry-go-round that just goes round and round in circles and we can never get off it. No, he says, history has a start point, it has a finish point, and it has a goal, it has a purpose. The creation of a bride for the Lord Jesus Christ. And therefore, says Peter, since we've become Christians, now we know what life is for, now we know where history is going, that should shape how we live. It gives meaning and direction to our lives. So verse 7, therefore be alert and of sober mind so that you may pray. Now note that carefully. Knowing that the end is near is meant to make us sober minded, not crazy minded. Very important to say that because throughout history there have been examples of well-intentioned Christians who've got so caught up with end-time speculation that they've started living like wild fanatics. That's not what Peter wants at all. We are not to be setting dates and we're not to be panicking because the world is in such a terrible state. 
No, we are to keep our heads and think clearly so that we can pray. I'm sure that had special meaning for Peter. If you remember his experience in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus said to him, Peter, watch and pray, which is pretty much what Peter is passing on to us here. Watch and pray. But that's not what Peter did. He fell asleep and then when he woke up, he panicked and started swinging a sword around everywhere and somebody's ear went flying. That wasn't glorifying to God. And now Peter says to us, dear brothers and sisters, learn from my foolish mistake. Be clear headed and pray. Now, is that you? And then verse 8, he adds, above all, love each other deeply because love covers over a multitude of sins. Not in the sense, of course, of washing sins away. Only the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ can do that. But love covers sins in the sense of bearing with one another's failings rather than making mountains out of molehills and ruining our fellowship. You see, love keeps little things from becoming big things and turning into the next world war to the delight of Satan uh, and the people who like to point the fingers at the church and its failings. So live a life of love, says Peter, because Christ is returning and he doesn't want to find his bride at war with herself. Now, is that how you live? As long as we are in this earthly church, love is largely going to be concerned with forgiving and forgetting. We will have to overlook an awful lot of things because we are sinful people. And that will take effort. That's what Peter's getting at when he says that we are to love deeply. He's not talking about maximum emotion. He's talking about maximum effort like an athlete straining every sinew. This is a big task, says Peter, to love one another in this way. He thinks it's really important because it's his second, the second time now in this letter he's used this same expression. You'll find it back in chapter 1 and verse 22. Love deeply, make every effort to love, because that reflects how God has loved us. You know, it would stagger us if we pause to consider just how much God's love bears with us. He bears with us despite our small-mindedness, our pettiness, our moodiness, our obnoxious personalities, all those things which drive us crazy about one another. God bears with them in all of us. And Peter says that's how we are to love now, that does not mean we condone one another's sins. It does mean that we don't make a big deal out of every bit of clumsiness in our relationships. In a fallen world, we spend a lot of time treading on one another's toes while we're trying to learn to dance together. But it really doesn't help if we point out somebody's small mistake every time. You know, that's my foot you're standing on. If we do that to one another constantly, it becomes so wearying, so discouraging. Now, patterns of behavior that are deeply destructive of individuals or of church fellowships, things that stop people growing in Christ, those things need to be addressed. But there are an awful lot of small things that are better overlooked rather than confronted. I'll tell you something I've learned over the years as a pastor. It's this that you've got to give people a great deal of slack as they grow as Christians. Love is not indulgent of serious sins, but love does know how to make allowance for people who are stressed, who are exhausted, or whose way of relating to others is just clumsy or immature. We've got to cut some, each other some slack on things like that. And that's what Peter's saying. In fact, he says, nothing is more important than this for our own growth and for our witness to the world, which is full of intolerance, impatience, hatred, unforgiveness. If we're going to show a different life, it matters above all else that we love one another like this. That's why Peter says, above all. 
Make this your top priority. He agrees with Paul there. Love is the greatest thing, says Paul in 1 Corinthians 13. Love above all, says Peter in 1 Peter chapter 4. Uh, and, and as Christ is returning, make that your priority. And then, verse 9, offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Well, hospitality to anybody is pleasing to God. But here Peter has building up the church in mind. Now, brothers and sisters, what comes to your mind when you hear the word hospitality? I guess for most of us, we think of a cup of tea and a biscuit, or maybe inviting somebody round for dinner. And all of that is good. But in the early church, it meant a great deal more than that. Consider, for example, the early churches met in homes. They didn't have any dedicated buildings like this lovely one in Priory Street where I'm making this recording. No, they met in homes. And that had many wonderful spin-offs. It gave them mobility. It meant it, it was relatively easy to plant another church somewhere else. And it saved them an enormous amount of resources of time and money. But there was a hidden cost to it. The cost was this. It meant that plenty of people had to be willing to open their homes every week, week in, week out, and to open their homes not just to a couple of specially invited guests, but to whoever turned up, whether or not they'd ever learned to wipe their feet before they came in or take their shoes off or not to put their feet on the coffee table. This was hospitality at some real cost, serious hospitality. But it helped the church to look and act and feel like a family. And I wonder, you know, if maybe one of the things God is going to do through COVID-19 is give us some of that back. It may be that we are able to meet as small groups in homes before we're able to meet again as a large group in this lovely building. So churches met in homes, that meant serious hospitality. Again, traveling preachers, missionaries needed places to stay. In the ancient world, there was no Airbnb and there were very few hotels and such as there were, were usually pretty dangerous places and overflowing with Im immorality. And so missionaries and, and traveling teachers, they would come, they would need places to stay, to expand the church, and they wouldn't just be staying overnight. They might be there for weeks, for months. Serious hospitality. And again, remember that in Peter's day, persecution was beginning to mount. And what did you do for Christians who had to flee their homes in fear of their lives? And they turned up on your doorstep and they're strangers, but how are they going to be preserved? unless you open your home and take in this whole family, or maybe two or three families. Serious hospitality. Do you see what a big deal hospitality is in the New Testament? That's why it's mentioned so many times. I don't think the scriptures would have, would have bothered so many references to hospitality if they'd simply meant a cup of tea and a biscuit. No, it's about using your resources, including your home, for the sake of the gospel, to expand the kingdom of God, to prepare a bride for the coming king by building up the church. It, it's about a, a willingness to put gospel advancement above personal comfort. And that is why hospitality is one of the requirements in the New Testament for Christian leadership. Because Christian leaders have to model the gospel. If Christian leaders will not put gospel advancement above personal comfort when it comes to hospitality, when are they going to put gospel advancement above personal comfort? And if they won't do that, how are they going to model it to the church? That is why hospitality is a requirement for Christian leaders. Now, it doesn't take a lot of imagination to realize that this kind of hospitality must often have been very inconvenient and quite exasperating. And it still can be. But here's Peter's point. When we're living in the light of the Lord's return, we're not living primarily for personal comfort and convenience. We're living for gospel expansion. We're living to build up the bride of Christ, the church. And when that's our perspective, it frees us to see our homes as gifts we can open rather than castles that we have to defend. 
And so, Peter says, offer hospitality to one another and do it without grumbling. Do it without wishing you didn't have to. Because grumbling is ultimately a complaint against God who has been so hospitable to us. Because when you think about it, every one of us was a refugee in need of shelter. And God took us in and he seated us at his table and he made us members of his family. And he did it all at incredible cost, the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the sign that we have received and appreciated this hospitality is that we now show it to others and that we do it without grumbling and resentment. And if I can add a little word of personal testimony at this point, although it can be an onerous thing to do, the blessings far outstrip the burdens. I can tell you that our home has been so blessed and our lives so enriched by the Christians who have come through our home, who have stayed with us, who have taught us so much. The missionaries who've come from different parts of the world and shared with us what God is doing. You know, you might think, oh, we've got children, we can't be involved in this. There is nothing better you could do for your children than let them see this kind of hospitality, letting them see that these are your gospel priorities, letting them meet missionaries from around the world who show them what it is to be armed with the attitude of Jesus, that they will go anywhere, serve anywhere, in any way, whatever the cost, for the glory of the King. What a way to bring up your children. What a way to disciple them. And then verse 10, each of you should use whatever gift you've received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. What Peter's saying is, God's given us different gifts and as we use them to build one another up, that's how we prepare the bride of Christ, the church, for the return of the bridegroom, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we've all been gifted by God for this purpose. And because he's given us gift, different gifts, do you know what's so great about that? It means we don't have to compare ourselves with others. We don't have to match somebody else's performance. We have to be the person that God has made us to be. And God loves variety. Peter here simply states that, that God gives his gifts in various forms, gives his grace in different ways. But elsewhere in the New Testament, you'll find lots of examples of this, whole long lists of gifts. And sometimes you'll even find gifts that aren't in the lists, but they're, they're mentioned elsewhere. Uh, I often think with, with a bit of a smile how when you talk of spiritual gifts, people's mind go to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, where Paul gives a list of, of all sorts of gifts that people find fascinating. But they often overlook the fact that earlier in that letter, Paul's already mentioned two other grace gifts in chapter 7, verse 7. There he, he mentions these two gifts, singleness and marriage. And he describes them as charismata, gifts of God's grace, the single state or the married state. And everybody in Caution Baptist Church has one or other of those gifts today. You're either single or you're married. And those, those are charismata, gifts of God's grace by his spirit. And it would change the way that you view singleness or marriage. If you wanted to improve your experience of either singleness or marriage, then just do this simple thing. Instead of asking, what am I getting out of it? How do I feel about it? Ask yourself, if you're married, how can we as a married couple use our marriage for its God-given purpose, which is Christian growth, building up the body of Christ? And if you're single, ask yourself, how can I use my single state to build up the body of Christ? But let's get back specifically to what Peter says here. Keep to Peter's point. God has given us each gifts, different gifts, varied gifts, but it's up to us to be what Peter calls in verse 10, faithful stewards of those gifts. He uses a word that was used of a manager in the ancient world, managing resources. It was the world word, for example, for the household slave who was very trusted and put in charge of all the master's resources. Well, our master's given us resources, gifts, and our master is returning. And, and what Peter is saying is, let's use those gifts to get ready 
for the master's purposes by building up his church for the wedding day. Now, Peter gives just a couple of examples, gifts of speaking and gifts of serving. Verse 11, if anyone speaks, they should do so as one who speaks the very words of God, which doesn't mean they're infallible. It means they should take their task seriously. If you are speaking in God's name, make every effort to, to think carefully about what you say, how you say it, and to make sure that what you say conforms to the written word of God. Now that applies especially to pastors, to missionaries, but also to junior church teachers, youth workers, people doing one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, people sharing a testimony, worship leaders, people singing. That's an awful lot of people, isn't it? Take the job seriously. Or again, verse 11, if anyone serves, they should do so with the strength God provides. Peter's probably got a whole range of things in mind. Practical tasks of service, admin, finance, care of the needy, practical help in a thousand ways, faithfully stewarding God's resources. And that can be exhausting, but we don't do it in our own strength, says Peter, but in the strength God supplies. Which means I do what I'm asked to do, but I don't have to do what I've not been asked to do by God. If God hasn't supplied me with that particular strength in my makeup, he's not expecting me to do it. He doesn't expect me to be as productive as Augustine or Calvin or Luther or Wesley or Spurgeon or these giants of the faith. I don't have the strength. But what God has given me to do, I can do because he gives the strength for that. And that applies to you too. And when we serve in that way, people will be blessed and ultimately God gets the glory. Verse 11, so that in all things God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory and the power forever and ever. Amen. And that's a great note on which to end. All things done for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. And amen simply means, I agree with that. So I hope you're saying amen, dear friends. Well, that is what living the rest of your life for the will of God looks like. You see how there's a terrific change of direction, of ambition when we become a Christian, because now we suddenly know where life is heading. We know what it's for. It's heading to the return of Christ. It's heading to a wedding day when Christ the bridegroom takes his bride, the church, and that shapes how we live. We're no longer drifting. We've got a purpose to prepare the bride of Christ, the church, for her wedding day by sharing the gospel and helping one another to grow in holiness, which means being clear-headed rather than drunk, verse 7, loving rather than lusting, verse 8, opening our homes for hospitality rather than orgies, verse 9, and using our gifts to serve one another rather than exploiting other people destructively, verses 10 and 11. Brothers and sisters, it's easy enough, I think, to understand this passage, isn't it? To see what Peter is saying. The hard part is living it. Are you living in the light of the end? The test of our commitment to Christ's return is not that we can draw all sorts of spectacular charts or predict the date. The test of our commitment to Christ's return is in the way that we live. So let me ask you, has Peter been describing the way you live? Let's pray. Father God, keep us watchful for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and serving faithfully by his Spirit, so that when he returns, his bride may be found ready and rejoicing for your glory's sake. Amen. Three questions for reflection and action. Number one, how is the promise of Christ's return shaping how you live? How is the promise of Christ's return shaping how you live. And number two, 
How are you using the gifts God has given you to build his church? How are you using the gifts God has given you to build his church? And the last question, what changes is God calling you to make as you reflect on this passage? What changes is God calling you to make as you reflect on this passage? Well, plenty of food there for thought and I hope profitable discussion amongst us and by the grace of God, application to our lives. God bless you, dear friends. Bye for now.